you have your Bible this morning, you want to turn to Colossians chapter 3. If you don't have your Bible with you, you can look on the screen, and uh, we have the Scripture there. Several weeks ago, I started a series on what would you do if you weren't afraid. I got that from a posting on a, uh, uh, an article about a posting on the wall of the Facebook uh, offices, and uh, the article said that there was a slogan up on the wall saying, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And uh, so uh, they are trying to encourage uh, people to just reach out and do things that they're not afraid of any kind of recrimination. They're willing to risk and uh, reach out. And so we're talking about things that you would do if you weren't afraid. Today we're talking about what would you do if you weren't afraid to forgive? What would you do today if you weren't afraid to forgive? Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, and then verses 12 through 14. Paul writes to the church at Colossae, Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Verse 12, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. He just told them that they're to be seated above and to be thinking about the things Christ thinks about. So, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other. And forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Sometimes revenge seems a lot sweeter than forgiveness, doesn't it? I read an article not long ago about a young lady who was attending school to become a dentist on her way to school one day, a man ran through an intersection and hit her car. The damage was not enough to keep her from driving off in her car, but she got out to see what the damage was. The man got out. He looked at the damage, didn't even apologize, got back in his car and drove away. Needless to say, she had to repair the damage to her car. It cost her money. It hurt her budget because she was in school. Just a few years later, she graduated and became a dentist. (laughs) One day, a man came into her office to get a root canal. (laughs) She recognized him. She told him it wouldn't hurt. (laughs) She lied. Sweet revenge. And isn't it true that oftentimes we think revenge is much better than forgiveness? The psychiatrist Sigmund Freud wrote, One must forgive one's enemies, but not before they've been hanged. (laughs) So why did Paul include this discussion about forgiveness in his letter to the church at Colossians, at, at Colossae? Would Christians ever hold a grudge? Would Christian people who have now been seated above with Christ ever not forgive? Sometimes we think the first century church was an ideal church. If only we could have been members of the first century church, everything would have been better than it is today with the modern church. But you have to remember the letters in the New Testament were written to combat problems in the first century church. And so evidently there were grievances. That English word that Paul uses here, the Greek word has been translated into English. A grievance was finding fault with someone, to be dissatisfied with someone. So evidently the church members at Colossae were dissatisfied with someone or finding fault with someone, maybe church members, possibly non-church members. You read earlier in this letter in chapter 2, verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy 
which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. So there were either church members or non-church members who were trying to bind the Christians at Colossae with tradition. In chapter 2, verses 16 through 23, Paul writes, Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Evidently, there were some very judgmental people in the church. Well, fortunately, they've all passed on, and they're not in churches anymore. But they were watching what other church members were doing. Not only watching them, but they were judging them about what they were doing. Paul says these are a shadow of things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Evidently, there were people who were so spiritual that they looked down on anyone else who had not had the same kind of visionary spiritual experiences that they had had. And they had this false humility, this piosity running off of them. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they've seen. You may have been around some of those. They want to tell you about all the heavenly visions that have come over them this week, and you're just trying to keep your head above water. You've got a boss that's difficult. You're not able to pay your bills. You've got some teenagers that are giving you problems, and they come along with all this spiritual talk. They've lost connection, he said, with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why As though you belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Now, that can be very irritating, right? When someone is always telling you what you should not do because you're a Christian. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with us, with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Evidently, some of the church members had lost what Paul encourages them to regain, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. They had become hard-edged religious people wanting to mold everyone into the mold which was most comfortable to them and obviously led to disunity because Paul writes in Colossians 3, 14, and over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Now, there are always things that tick religious people off and only religious people. Like somebody getting into your pew on Sunday morning. The one you always sit in, you've always sat there. You've sat there since this building was built. It has your prints. You're comfortable there. One Sunday when I was pastoring in Wichita, Kansas, a pulpit committee came to hear me preach. They were from Dallas, Texas. And after the service, one of the men came up to me, and and he said uh, he sat down two rows from the front on the end seat. We had theater seats there, and he sat in that chair, that theater seat. And he said, an older lady, and I recognized who she was, is Miss Bessie Williams. He said, an older lady came up to him and tapped him on the shoulder. He looked up, and she said, you must be a visitor today. (laughs) And he thought, how nice. In a church this large, if someone would notice I was a visitor. He said, yes, thank you. How did you know? She said, you're in my seat. Religious people can really get ticked off about things like that. So Paul is appealing to the first century church to forgive whatever grievances 
they may have against one another. Whatever covers what? Whatever. And if we were looking at this letter today, and Paul had written it to us, what would be our whatever grievance list that we're holding on to today? What is it I'm holding against someone? What is it that I think someone owes me? Well, there are a lot of things. I was insulted by someone close to me. I was manipulated into doing something that I hate. I was cheated out of a top spot in college. I'm being constantly criticized by someone close to me. And we could go on and on and on with our whatever grievances list. Why are we afraid to forgive those things? Why do we hold on to them? Well, we are afraid to look weak. They took advantage of us. We're afraid to look stupid. I'm going to stand my ground here. We're afraid of what it might cost. We're afraid they won't pay a price for wronging me. They took something from me, and we want them to pay. Paul appeals to those who are holding on to this grievances list to forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. As the Lord forgave you covers how we're to forgive. Whatever covers what we're to forgive. So how do we forgive as the Lord forgave us? The English language has one word for forgive. The New Testament, the Greek language, has three words for forgive. In this particular passage, Colossians 3.13, Paul says, bear with each other and forgive one another. And he uses a word for forgiveness which has as its root the word for grace. And grace, charis, means gift. And so Paul uses a word here which is saying to the Colossians, gift this person with forgiveness. Grant them forgiveness. Do it as a favor, as the Lord did for you. The second word that's used in the New Testament for forgiveness is the word that means the cancellation of an obligation or a debt. In Luke 6, 37, Jesus said, do not judge, you do not be judged. Do not condemn, you'll not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. In other words, cancel that debt. You've put their behavior into the debt column. They owe it to you. They have not paid it. You're going to keep it as a debt. Jesus says, don't do that. Cancel the debt. Psalm 32, 2 says, Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him. That's what Paul's talking about. But there's a third word that's used in the New Testament more often than any other word. And I think this word is a word that would help us today more than any other word for forgiveness. In Mark eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus said, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. This first word meant grace them with it, do a favor for them. The second word meant cancel the debt. This third word means to release it, to hurl it, a way to free yourself from it. The Aramaic word, which is probably what Jesus spoke for forgive, means literally to untie yourself. To untie yourself. Jesus forgave our sins freely. He canceled the debt or the obligation to pay for our sins. He did it graciously, freely. He released us from our sins. He hurled them away from us. He untied us from the debt that we owed to him. The psalmist in 103.12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So this word forgive, a fear me, means to willingly throw away any resentment you may have for being wronged. We're not simply to contain it or restrain it, but to let go of it 
So we are totally free of its influence. Forgive, letting that person or that act go. Not maintaining a destructive relationship, energy drain in our own lives. Forgiveness is a spiritual act of compassionately releasing resentments, anger, or a desire to punish someone else for an offense. It's a state of grace. Nothing you can force or pretend. No shortcuts. Dr. S.I. Macmillan wrote a book entitled None of These Diseases. He said, the moment I start hating a man, I become his slave. I can't enjoy my work anymore because he controls my thoughts. My resentments produce too many stress hormones in my body, and I become fatigued after only a few hours of work. The work I formerly enjoyed is now drudgery. Even vacations cease to give me pleasure. The man I hate hounds me everywhere I go. Ethicist Lewis Smeads has written a book about forgiveness and identified four stages in the process of forgiveness, of letting it go. The first, he says, occurs at the point of our hurt. We've been injured in some way, spiritually, emotionally, or materially, and we feel the injury. Second, we hate. The injury we feel boils into an active resentment of the person who committed the injury. And this, too, is a natural response. So we experience resentment and actual hatred. Third, he says, we begin to heal. At this point, we finally let go. It is the critical moment of forgiveness. And unlike hurting or hating, it is anything but natural. It's natural to hurt when someone has hurt you. It's natural to hate when someone has hurt you, but this is the moment only a Christian can appreciate. Because to let go of hatred means we need the strength to operate on us that will work entirely in the opposite direction of hurting and hating. Healing can come quickly or it can take time. Finally, Smead says, as we heal, we forget. This does not imply some kind of sentimental amnesia nor is it really possible simply by force of will to simply forgive and forget. Rather, forgetting means we no longer allow our past resentments to be the judge of the trespasser. We have to be prepared for trespassers who either do not think they need forgiveness or who do not really care whether you or anyone else forgives for anything. We need to make a distinction here. In the case of someone who shows no desire for our forgiveness, forgiving means we stop thinking up ways to hurt them. Dr. Andrew Weil has written a book on health, and he suggests that one can forgive another one either personally, face-to-face, verbally, or in written form, or if that person has already died, one can forgive them in prayer. But it's important to forgive and to let it go. Now, what would we do if we weren't afraid to forgive? First of all, we would untire ourselves from another person's attitude or offense. We would loosen ourselves from their ugliness. Second, we would stop the damage we're doing to ourselves. Dr. Lewis Smead's rights to forgive is to set a prisoner free and to discover that the prisoner was you. In general, forgiveness is linked to better mental and physical health. A Stanford University research study shows that practicing forgiveness decreases stress, decreases anger, and psychosomatic symptoms. Recent research has shown that people who scored higher on forgiveness scales had significantly lower levels of blood pressure, anxiety, and depression. People who scored higher on forgiveness scales also had relatively high self-esteem and life satisfaction. Feelings of anger, shame, and guilt over the sins of others and personal transgressions tend to dissipate. 
Neil Krauss, researcher from the University of Michigan, says, those that forgive unconditionally are the ones that seem to have better mental health. You get the hurt behind you. Ultimately, it does more for us than for anyone else because it releases us from the negativity and it lets us move forward. Sometimes the pain is unavoidable, but our response is what determines how much we suffer. What would we do if we weren't afraid to forgive? We would feel more forgiven by God and be more forgiving of ourselves. Jesus made it plain there's no practical way we can experience forgiveness unless we're willing to forgive. Matthew 6, 12, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So how can God forgive us our debts if we have not also forgiven our debtors? If we are holding on to our debtors, then we're saying to God, that's the way we want you to forgive us. Matthew 6, 14, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. If God is forgiving God and we are unforgiving creatures, we'll never sense his forgiveness. When we acknowledge that we ourselves have been forgiven, we find it easier to forgive others. Researcher Dan Escher from Notre Dame University says that data from his general society survey shows that the long-term practice of religion has a positive effect on forgiveness. So Paul is talking to people here who know Christ. Those affiliated with the religious tradition since age 16, says Escher, show a greater likelihood to be forgiving. The religiously unaffiliated have less of a propensity to forgive. Why should a non-believer forgive anybody that doesn't pay their debt? They themselves have never felt forgiven. Psalm 103, verses 8 through 14 tells us that How a person perceives God makes a difference in the way they treat themselves, their co-workers, their relatives, and their neighbors. Researchers have said if the God we believe in is a loving Father who forgives unconditionally, then it's more likely for us to forgive ourselves and in turn forgive others. Listen to the psalmist, 103, 8 through 14. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. This is this kind of God. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. So it makes a difference in the God we believe in. Is he a loving father who forgives unconditionally? Or is he a distant sovereign who judges us harshly? 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. A study in the Journal for Scientific Study of Religion found that trust in God's forgiveness makes it more likely for individuals to forgive themselves and in turn makes it easier for them to extend mercy to others. If the God we believe in is a distant sovereign who judges us, we will have more difficulty forgiving ourselves, and extending forgiveness to others. Studies show that setting conditions on forgiveness, such as requiring acts of contrition, is associated with greater psychological stress. If the God you serve is a God who's going to exact the last ounce of flesh from you for your wrongs and your sins then you're going to have some psychological stress. When I pastored a small country church in the hills of Arkansas, we had a lady in our church who had been raised in Canada, and she had gone to uh, Catholic school while she was being raised, and unfortunately, the sisters in that school had been very harsh, and when she did something wrong, 
they would take small pebbles or rocks and put them in her shoes and make her wear those around all day long to pay her penance. And as a result of that, she saw God as a very harsh and demanding God. And she had great difficulty in ever forgiving herself. She walked around feeling guilty all day long. If we weren't afraid to forgive, we would turn the bad or the negative into something good and something positive. Or see, forgiveness is serious business. It affects everything we are, everything we do. If anyone has ever done you a serious wrong, you know how serious forgiveness is. There's one heartbreaking scene in the movie, Forrest Gump. If you ever saw that movie, you remember one of the central characters named Jenny was a little girl who returned to the old homestead, the old farmhouse where she was raised. And getting back to that old farmhouse brought up memories of the sexual abuse that she had suffered from her father when she was a child. And as she looked at that old farmhouse and those memories came back to her, she began to bend over and grab rocks and throw at that old house, grab rocks and throw at that old house, grab rocks and throw at that old house, and finally she just crumpled to the ground and began to weep. And Forrest Gump looks at her and says to her, sometimes there just aren't enough rocks. There never are enough rocks. If someone has mistreated you, if someone has lied about you, if someone has cheated you, if someone's tried to destroy you, if deep in your heart there's a hidden place where there's so much resentment toward another human being that you secretly wish them dead, there are never enough rocks. That's why forgiveness is such a serious business. God forgives us because of what Jesus has done for us. But then he commands us to forgive others because of what Jesus is doing in us. Forgiveness is hard, but living with hatred or grudge is even harder. Keeping grudges or hurts bottled up can be dangerous to ourselves and to others. True forgiveness, the kind Paul's talking about here, the kind Jesus talked about, is unconditional and not predicated on any act or request from the offender. True forgiveness frees me and you from damaging rage, depression, and despair that bottled up resentment causes. The best revenge is your success, your happiness, and your triumph of not giving hurtful people any dominion over your peace of mind. Forgiveness is serious business. What would you do if you weren't afraid to forgive? I'm going to ask you to do a few things this week. Number one, answer these questions. Number one, what is the most damaging hurt I'm holding on to today? It may be something from the time you were a child. It could be when you were in college. It could be from last week or yesterday. What is the most damaging hurt I'm holding on to today? Second, how can I untie myself from that hurt? There are people who go all the way through life defining themselves by something that happened to them when they were young. Third, what one thing can I do to forgive myself? If your God is a loving, forgiving God, you'll have an easier time forgiving yourself. Fourth, what one thing can I do to forgive someone else? Maybe Dr. like Dr. Wiles says, maybe you need to write a letter. Maybe you just need to bow your head in prayer and in prayer forgive that person. Let's pray together. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer today, we thank you for forgiveness, for giving us a way to untie ourselves from the resentments and hurts that come as a result of living life. Lord, we pray today that we might see you as the loving God who gave yourself willingly and freely on the cross to forgive us willingly and freely of all of our sins. 
Bless now this time of invitation. Bless those who need to make commitments to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Bless those who need to come to be a part of our church. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.